Thanks, Jeff. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be back in Townsville and uh, share a little bit about what we've been doing in terms of connectivity at this new university in Saudi Arabia, uh, which we call KAUST because King Abdullah University of Science and Technology is a, a bit of a mouthful. I just want to acknowledge uh, very quickly some of the uh, postdocs and students who have contributed a lot of the data that you're going to see in, uh, this, in these slides. Uh, so, <clears throat> KAUST is, um, as I said, a, a very new place. Uh, we are located right on the waterfront, and uh, it really is a beautiful campus. Uh, several of uh, uh, people from JCU and UQ have been over to visit. Uh, I'd encourage you all to, to come, come see it sometime. Oh. Okay, well, <laughs> our colleagues in Israel understand we have a little bit of a political issue. <laughs> <laughs> we will uh, we'll discuss later. <laughs> uh, so this is where we're located. Uh, we're right in the central part of the Red Sea. Uh, if you're not familiar with the geography, Saudi Arabia has almost 2,000 kilometers of Red Sea coastline. Um, and then uh, we've got uh, lots of neighbors in the area with, which have um, also got really nice reefs. There's, there's fringing coral reefs and offshore reefs along both sides of this coast. So I think we could argue that technically the Red Sea is the longest reef in the world, not bigger than the Great Bear Reef, but longer. Uh, anyway, what we knew about connectivity uh, when, we're, when we started with Cal, in connectivity in the Red Sea is, uh, is very little. And this is just based on some um, web of knowledge uh, searches that show you, in, if you look at what we think are comparable regions in terms of size and diversity, in the Caribbean and the Great Barrier Reef compared to the Red Sea. The Red Sea is, is pretty far behind in terms of numbers of publications that we've seen in this area. So we, we came into um, CALS with a bit of a knowledge gap and uh, for, the, for the broader Red Sea. So we just published this um, review a couple months ago. And the problem is not just with connectivity research. Uh, it's sort of a sy systematic issue about um, number of publications that, that we've got to build on in a whole variety of uh, coral reef related topics. So the Red Sea was uh, a very interesting place for us to um, come into in terms of uh, broad interest in ecology and trying to tackle some of these problems. But I do want to acknowledge that the problem is even a little bit more subtle than that. If we look at one of those um, subcases, for example, with apex predators, um, each of these red and blue dots represents a published study. And you can see that the vast majority come from, uh, and probably half of that comes from one person sitting in this room. And uh, so what we know about the rest of the Red Sea is really lacking. And um, so, uh, and one last point on this, on this data, if we look at this figure, especially for connectivity, a lot of what we what, what qualifies as a Red Sea study is a global study where they have one sample from the Red Sea. And so technically we don't have a lot of information about connectivity in the Red Sea itself. So as we began to look at a few um, things, just doing routine work and observations and surveys, we began to realize that a lot of even what we, had, what we were looking at turned out not to be what we thought we were looking at. So there's been uh, a lot of emphasis on um, almost cataloging biodiversity, which I think is the evolutionary end result of connectivity. So um, if you, I mean, I, I could spend hours going through all the things that we thought were one species and after some molecular or morphological work we realize are a unique species in the Red Sea. So endemism in the Red Sea is rising as we find some of these things to be different from the West Indian Ocean um, counterparts. For example, this uh, stocky um, hawkfish uh, we've got something going on right now with the Pseudochromis where we have uh, four very distinct color morphs and what's, we have really, really strong spatial genetic partitioning in the species that does not correspond to colors. And then we have uh, these four color morphs which re within a region show absolutely no um, genetic signature whatsoever. So we're not really sure what's going on with these guys, but that's a, a work in progress. Just to show you uh, a reef fish, which if you've ever swum on a reef in the Indo-Pacific, you'll have seen this guy, Tinichidis striatus, in the Red Sea has this very uh, distinct orange fin. The first time Howard Choate took one look at this thing, he said, something is wrong with this fish. 
he then proceeded to shoot several of them, of course. <laughs> and we are in the middle of, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this particular story. We're pretty sure that uh, this guy may change in the Red Sea as well. Uh, a a non-fish example, uh, Tridacna costata is a, um, a, a species of giant clam that was only described in 2007 from Jordan where they had approximately 12 individuals. It was in current biology, big story about this really, really restricted range and used to be really common. It's been fished out by humans. Uh, uh, about six months ago, we found one in the southern uh, Saudi Arabian Red Sea, so we extended the range of this by about 2,000 kilometers. And of course, that probably means it's in here somewhere. But this is, again, just to show you how little uh, we, we've been able to study, uh, especially parts of Saudi Arabia. Um, among other things we've discovered, uh, there's a new genus of possible poured coral that we've got. Um, so there's lots of fun stories like this, but that, like, as I said, that's kind of the in evolutionary end of connectivity. So um, to come back to uh, a, a little bit more about what we've seen in some of the fishes, uh, there's a lot of endemic species in the Red Sea. Butterfly fish in particular, 50% uh, of the species of butterfly fish in the Red Sea are endemic to the Red Sea. And they have really interesting distribution patterns. So there's a couple of species which are only found in the north of the Red Sea. There's a few species which happily cover the whole Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, but don't go beyond that. Then there are some species which just penetrate into the southern end of the Red Sea, but just don't make it north of that. Um, then, of course, there are a few species which we have um, here on the Great Barrier Reef and right across through to the northern Red Sea. Um, <clears throat> Some of these guys have really interesting patterns that I have trouble explaining, like Ketodona riga, which happily occurs in the central and north in the western Indian Ocean, but it is not found anywhere in the southern, Indian Ocean, in the southern Red Sea. So all of these things uh, taken together tend to suggest that there's something going on. There's some environmental restrictions, barriers to dispersal, barriers to connectivity that are going on that affect different species in different ways. And so... Um, uh, for example, these guys are, these two species are found throughout the Red Sea, but are very, very rare in the north. And so we're trying to begin to understand what's driving these patterns of, of biogeography and connectivity in the Red Sea. So to show you some work by uh, Garrett Nanaga, who's here with us, um, this is uh, looking at uh, the uh, environmental gradients that we have in the Red Sea. There's very strong north to south gradients in salinity, temperature, uh, turbidity, nutrients, all of these things change. And, and notably, when you get down to this region, just north of the Yemen border, there, there is a very strong environmental break where in the north of this, we see these really classic, very steep, oligotrophic, blue water coral reefs that the Red Sea is famous for. And in the south, uh, we start to get a lot more productivity, a lot more nutrients in the water. And if you look at chlorophyll A, for example, distribution throughout the Red Sea, there's a very strong gradient there. So in this study I'm going to show you, we use chlorophyll A as a, as a proxy to match up with some of the population genetics we did on um, a species of clownfish. And the, this is also endemic to the Red Sea. We sampled sites all up and down the coast, um, really almost got from border to border in Saudi. Um, and if we look at this uh, genetic data, we see not a lot of mixture except, I'm sorry, we see a lot of mixture except one uh, area that pops out, and that is the southernmost site, the, the one that's across that habitat boundary that I showed you. If we look at the structure, uh, it's a very gradual um, gradient until we get down to the uh, far south, and then we see a pretty clear break here. Is this reversed, Garrett? This is flipped upside down, sorry. This, this is the, the southern break, so just flip that in your mind. That's <laughs> perfectly clear. Um, what we could do is um, we did do some tests where we wanted to see if, environmental, uh, if the environmental distance explains uh, more than the geographic distance does using chlorophyll A as a measure of environmental distance, and I'll just what we can, if we just look at a traditional isolation by distance, we can explain a lot of the genetic variability. If, and just so that's this panel on the far right. If we look at this panel on the uh, bottom right, this is a method that allows us to combine the habitat difference along with geographic distance and we can explain 
about 90% of the genetic data. So it suggests pretty strongly that what's happening in the Red Sea is that distance does matter, but the environment uh, also is structuring some of these populations in the same way. Now across that same gradient, we've also looked at a sponge. And um, with the sponge, the story is a lot more complicated, but we see patterns of inbreeding in some areas of high productivity. We still see this southern, this is aligned with the map. We still see very strong structure from the southern populations and lots of mixing throughout the, the central part. So um, I think there's a lot that we can learn about connectivity patterns starting with population genetics. So we're starting, th these are all the species that we're looking at, pop gen questions, uh, including anemones, sponges, a whole bunch of fish. And of course, we're sampling as widely as we can. This is Sudan. We've pulled off some sampling in Sudan. There's some obvious political and logistic challenges there. Yemen is tricky. I have guys in a Yemeni island uh, this week. Uh, we just got back last week from a trip to the Saudi part of the Gulf of Aqaba. So we're, we're gradually starting to get some ideas about what's happening in this region. So that leads me to um, come back to Tinikita striatus and just tell you uh, what, we've, what we've been seeing there. Um, if we look at a traditional microsats or mitochondrial markers for uh, Tinikita striatus, we see absolutely no structure in the whole of the Red Sea and nothing different between the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea either. We're starting to use lots of next-gen approaches. So this is data from rad tag sequencing. And um, what we see with Tinikita striatus, the, um, it doesn't matter if you're outside the Red Sea, all the way up through the Red Sea, until, but somewhere between Port Sudan and the Northern Red Sea, this thing totally changes genetically. There's some something really big going on here, and I can't tell you wh where that break is. Of course, we're now going to start running samples from in these areas to try and figure out what's happening here and why this species shows this pattern. So um, anyway, lots of cool stories to come. Now, just to jump ahead to techniques you probably expect our group to talk a lot more about, and that's parentage analysis. Of course, we have done that too with the clownfish uh, and at one reef near Kaust. Around this particular reef, uh, we sampled a few hundred uh, clownfish on 150 anemones. Um, there's just some numbers here for you. We then sampled a few hundred recruits from reefs within, say, 10 to 15 kilometers around there, just to do a classic parentage you know, dispersal. And can we find uh, any juveniles that self-recruited back to this island, this run reef? And the answer was in 2012, no. We have one individual. In 2013, we had no individuals that we screened come back to their natal reef. If you're familiar with the stories from Kimby Bay or Manus or the Keppels or, or other parentage-based projects, this is really weird. <laughs> this is totally unexpected where normally we're seeing 30, 40% self-recruitment, if not higher. And for some reason here we see zero. Uh, we also found very, very little dispersal that we could capture in that, in that neighborhood. So this led us to start to question whether this was something weird about the Red Sea, something weird about the species. Um, and uh, we, so we ran a physical model around, you know, of larvae dispersing from that reef. And indeed, the physical model suggests that most of these larvae are going to be carried far away outside of our study area. So, What's happening in the Red Sea may be very different than what we know from other parts of the world. Which, and if we go back one last time to that idea that we don't know a lot about the Red Sea, it's a fun place to be working right now because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of, uh, of space that's wide open. So I'll leave it at that. We do have uh, we're always looking for good students. So, and my last note on that point is if you're interested in collaborating and uh, interested in getting some work done in the Red Sea. A great way to do that is to identify a, a very good master's or PhD student who we can have. We have external supervisors, so that can be your ticket to come uh, play with us in the Red Sea. So anyway, thanks very much. I'd be happy to ask questions, if, answer questions if we have any time. Thank you.